Hello, my name is Juan Jose Torres Albelo. I'm uh, from Puerto Rico, from a town called Ciales. It's in the, uh, it's in the north part of the central, in, of the central mountain chain. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I, I grew up all, all there, uh, up, up there, uh, surrounded with nature and, and a lot of resources. It was kind of a magical place. So it's, uh, back in the day, it was uh, the, one of the biggest uh, coffee producers on the island. So when you're going out into the balcony, you're going to see these whole bunches of coffee farm covering all, all the hills and all that, and forests and rivers and all that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, um, question, why are you on St. Croix? So what because, well, in 2017, there was a vacancy about soil conservationists, and I came here. I just accepted, and then uh, I translate. I just moved here to the island to work uh, as a soil conservationist for the NRCS, USDA. So I was working from 2017 up to today. <laughs> oh yeah, because I'm an archaeologist. Uh, well, well, I kind of, I, I kind of, uh, I kind of a weird mixture because my bachelor degree is in agronomy, <laughs> Agrofore uh, agroforestry, and biological nitrogen fixation, but. Always my passion was history because my mother was a history teacher and she always gave me these books and all that and I, and I just devoured those books like, <laughs> like, like a, wow, like a crazy. Uh -huh. So one time I went to this uh, presentation in the, in, the, in the university, uh, the Caribbean Center of Ad Advanced uh, Studies in, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and there was this debate and they were talking about the Taino Indians, my, my people, my ancestors, and they were promoting these notions about the weakness of the Taino bows. So I just start to, because I'm an archer too, so I start to debating with the person, and then the, the dean of that time approached to me and say, well, do you are interested in studying archaeology? And I said, well, yes, yeah, you know, I'm from, I'm from agronomy. So, and then another, another archaeologist approach, man, you are good, you should, should study archaeology. So I said, like, oh, yeah, two or two, okay. So, I went more to my home and then I talked to my mom and said, mom, this happened to me in the university. I said, well, you have an attitude for that, so why do you do it? So I just send the application and then I spent four years doing my thesis. <laughs> so, and also, I, uh, I try to make a bridge between my bachelor degree, my knowledge, and my hobby. Because since I was six years old, or I was shooting bows and arrows. Because the first thing that my great grandmother, she was a, a, a native, gave me to play was a short, a short, it was a bow. Because I was passing all around shooting bows and every time I break it they give me, make me another one so I grew up with that so and then I was talking with the uh, with this elder in Puerto Rico and she saw the bows she's uh, one of the Taino elders and she said to me wait what, why do you try to bring back our bow our weapon our traditional weapon well I, I, I well they say well that, that's, a, that's a that's a big homework so I just putting on the things to do. Then when I came to the when when we were discussing uh, in the in the class, which is gonna be your topic for the thesis, I was like, you know, no, say no. Oh, I was gonna do experimental archaeology. In what topic? Bows and arrows. So there is evidence of that. Yeah. Hmm. So I just started to compile all the information about the bow and arrow in the Caribbean and how they work, how they was, what which types, because it's not a, like a one bow for everybody. Every tribe has a type of bow, different fletchings, kind of similar weapons, the points, the arrowheads. But the thing is that since almost 7,000 years before the presence of Europeans here in the Caribbean, the Caribbean was a hub of culturally diverse. Groups were coming out from Central America 
another group was coming up to South America and then successive waves came up and all these people bring their plants, their food, their culture and their bows. And every culture is kind of staunch defendant about their bow because their bow defines what they are. And, and they are very proud. So the thing is about those dynamics and the bow in the in the function of the bow in the Caribbean, it gives the identity and independence to these people to dominate and establish. You, you, you're not only hunting with the bow, you can fish and you can defend the family. And actual and actually among the the Caribbean cultures, even the women were warriors. Proof of that, you have right here on South, on, on South River when a, uh, when a Cari woman killed two Spaniards with a bow and arrow and she was standing on a canoe. Yep. So there you have. So this is the importance. So the thing is that, and also it's medular because one, once that you strip the bow from an indigenous group, you're starting to rob them their identity, their independence. So, and the thing is that the bow is like, okay, the bow disappearing in the, in the historical record around the 16th, uh, 16th century, 17th century. But the thing is that the memory prevails. And that's in anthropology is called phantom technology. You know what is the weapon? Do you know how it works? Do you know for what it is? But you don't remember how to make it. You can create it but it's not at the same level of efficiency that in the past. So that is enough. Uh, with also with the help of chronicles like Pere Labat, who uh, was a French missionary, and he spent time with the with the Kalina Indians in in, in the in the Lesser Antilles, and they give such precise descriptions about the item that made for an archeo uh, a Korean archaeologist is like. What is this? But for an archer and a boyer, and a boyer is a person who makes bows and arrow, is enough information to bring it back from the land of the dead. This is a, a bow uh, used for the caribs. It's called irapa. The irapa are wide and flat. So. Which bows, uh, there's, there's a, a thing going on about saying like, oh, you know, the, the caribs were more brave. Yeah. But uh, the caribou bow is more stronger? No. The thing is, it depends of the craftsmanship of the bow and what type of bow you want. Because some of the tribes has a hunting bow, like this one, which is uh, maybe 15, between uh, 45, 45 pounds to 50 pounds, sometimes you have war bows. War bows tend to be a little bit bigger and they are around between 85 pounds to 100 pounds. When I mean the pounds is the, the strength that you need to pull the string from here up to the up to the young line. So those were strong bows and, the, and, and even that the reach of those bows were bigger than the musket. An average musket can have an, uh, an uh, a reach of 70 meters, but an, a native bow has a reach of 90 meters and more. So you have these Europeans coming in the, into the valley and then you have the natives hiding in the bush like this. And they start to throw in volleys of arrows and an archer can launch between four to six and up to seven arrows in 10 seconds. Fwam, fwap, fwap. So imagine 700 piece of natives shooting against invaders. So that makes you ponder about uh, somebody in the Chronicles is lying. So, and that is the important thing because once that you prove the facts, okay, we have this, 
and then we have this tail. But in the field, when you do the practice, it tells you another thing. Well, the record is almost like a 400 feet, like 400, 400 feet. That's maybe like a 90, 90 meters or more. Wow. So, and the thing, and the thing is that those people also have plenty of ammo because they have the point for war, which is famously because it has a machinial poison, mm -hmm. which is one of the 10 most dangerous plants in the world. And also they know how to make more poisons about, about using different plants and animals. Mm -hmm. And they have for fishing, for hunting birds, because the feathers were a resource of exchange, not for the not for the arrows, the headdresses, the capes. They used to make capes of, of feathers, the adornments, the, the for the ears and all that. Feathers was an item of, of exchange, and also the back then the richness, the richness of bird fauna in the islands were humongous. And you have like around 12 species of parrots across all the islands. And then you have less than a, a, a species of macaw in the bigger islands and also parrots. So you have plenty of pretty feathers to exchange. And these people travel between the islands because this is another thing that promotes sometimes, sometimes promotes in the, in the classrooms. See, is not a barrier, it's a highway. And our ancestors know that. And they travel in that canoe with maybe 70 to 80 men rowing. <whistles> and, there is a, and, there is a, and there is a record of a chronicle that was Columbus was in the, in the boat and then they saw this canoe of, of guys coming, rowing, and then passing by like, yeah. Well, like they were pretty fast so they were sea people they know they were masters of land and sea and the Taino word is Guamikina so when I was talking when I was talking to you later this is not a this is not a bow from the from the Caribbean this is a flat bow mm -hmm. this uh, this bow was was, uh, was made from one of the guys here but yeah uh, I use uh, uh, my friend Matt giving it to me to refine it, so I just refine it. And this is a normal arrow. And the thing is that I started to do the archery thing because archery is an expensive hobby. But you, you have kids in the school that wants to learn archery and they are and they want and they uh, and they wish it so what about to give them opportunity so what about to give him to teach them how to make their own tackle of their own island so let me see if i can get a demonstration of this okay Whoa. you get there <laughs> <laughs> so that was the main the main reason so it's to this elite uh, to take away from the elite and doing more approachable. Oh, well, you know, people say like, oh, "Okay, you are going to teach them the, the kids uh, to use a weapon." No, no, that's the wrong set of mind. It's a tool. It's something to develop. It's a tool that you can form minds and spirits. Because from ancient times, and it's something that it came from even our great 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 grandfather from Africa, 7,000 BC, mm -hmm. 70,000 BC, the first evidence of use of arrows <laughs> came all that knowledge, all the way to, uh, to spread to all the world, and it helped to form humans, to teach them focus. To teach them achieve goals, form the spirit, because it's not only a stick with the strain to throw, to throw arrows, it has a lot of things incomposed in a very simple thing. The coexistence.
they consist is a symbol of survival. Mm -hmm. Our societies was started with this. The spear launcher is the father or the forefather or the forefather of the bow. But the spear launcher was from a time to take down bigger animals like mammoths and all that. But a difference to the bow, it doesn't have the reach of the bow, but it has more power because it multiplies the length of the arm. Mm. So what you do, and this is a dart. What you do is you put the dart on here and throw it. And that's the way our great, great ancestors hunted big animals without getting harmed because uh, before that they used spears to get close to the animal and and you know stabbing a, a, a woolly rhinoceros with a spear is not a good idea <laughs> i've never seen that before the spear launcher the spear launcher yeah is cosmopolitan every part of the of the world and even today there are people that are still using it wow. so and also there's some archaeological evidence from here to St. Croix, near to Christian there, when they found the spur. The spur is this part of the end when you put the dart. And they found it in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the coastline, I think in the top of Christian state. Wow. And, and the article, you can check it in internet because it's free and you can find it. <laughs> and so, the other thing? Oh, this know. other thing? Okay. Yeah. This is a jade condor. It was found in Vieques Island, uh, the neighborhood, right there. Mm -hmm. And it's found there in, the, I think it was uh, uh, in the, in the Wekan site. And you know that there are not condors in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So that means that where you can find condors? Down there, South America. And back then, this, the territory of the condor stretches up near, up to the coast of Venezuela. So where our friends, the Arawaks, came from. And our ancestors. So the thing is that some of the archaeologists say like, oh, that's a spear launcher. So in order to put to rest that theory, I just, my friend, Cotubanama in Puerto Rico, is an artisan, a Taino artisan, made a replica of the item. So I made a spear launcher and tried to use it. So, so what happened is that a difference with that, you don't have a, a point of, of anchoring because you were gonna have problems to, yeah. to put it there. Yeah. So. Imagine you say like, okay, I'm in a conflict, so I want to try that. I can do it. I can throw it more quickly with this yeah. and this. So maybe this was an adornment for a headdress or something else, but it was not an atalatl spare. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have here uh, in the making, this is a butu. It was made from uh, from lignum vitae. The butus normally are made from hardwoods, like lignum vitae, mm -hmm. and they were made to dispatch the enemy. <laughs> so sometimes you can have you, you have the the macana, which is another war club that is bigger, but the butu is smaller because it's just to uh, to get the enemy on the knees. And, and if you're going to uh, to close combat, you can hit hard. Uh, fast, break bones, yeah. break bones and the skull. This is lignum vitae. It's a solid wood. Um, have you used any of the wood here on St. Croix? Like yes, yeah. these are woods from St. Croix. <laughs> these woods, uh, this is a uh, bushberry ah. uh, that I collected from the road after, after Hurricane Maria when I came. So, oh. so, you have the materials. So the thing is that is to teach the people how to use it. And the thing is that you do things from the land. And this is a 100% healthy pastime. Because not only do you spend skills like weaving 
uh, gluing and all that because you were gonna to learn about the nature of your land, the trees, the seasons, when do you harvest, when you cut it, how do you process it, all that is connected to the bow. It, that's that's part of the magic and the knowledge you of traditional. To use it. And you, you use it indoors. <laughs> no, you can you, you can. And also it's something like it's part of every one of us. Every one of us has an ancestor that was a boyer and an archer and because of their sacrifice mm. that's why we are here. Show us some more of your bows, what they look like. Okay, this is an, this is a. How long does it take you to do a bow? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. There is a fa uh, a fast a fast uh, process that it takes maybe a week. Mm -hmm. uh, some uh, there's another faster uh, process that it takes only 24 hours, but those bows are just for occasions. Mm. A good bow can take maybe to one year to two years to make because you have to process the wood, leave it to, a pro uh, to dry to a certain point, and then process it. And it takes a lot of patience to make a bow. You cannot have, you cannot be angry or thinking something, something else because you were gonna bring that in your mind into the bow. Ah. So even in the, in the, in the, in the, past, in the past times, the, man's, the, the, the men, goes to a process of called coima. Coima is the abstinence of anything. No alcohol, no sex, no nothing. No, no yuppie yuppie. <laughs> no yuppie yuppie. Mm -mm. <laughs> to make a bow. Yeah. And make a good bow. And the bows, when were so very, very good crafted, was an item to exchange expensive kind of uh, item of exchange but because you can go to to your father-in-law I want to marry your daughter with the bow <laughs> so that was expensive even I, 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 I read that a bow was a cost of three pots <laughs> big ones <laughs> so it was that it was as important <laughs> So this is, an, this is another one that is from local wood. This is a Campeche wood. The Campeche is very, very, very curious uh -huh. because it has the, the white wood uh -huh. is yellow, but the, but the hardwood is red. Uh -huh. But this is the most important thing. It contains a dye that when you boil it in the water, it turns the water red. But it gets more interesting because if you add uh, calcium from a seashell pulverized it turns to violet and if you add some vinegar it turns to yellow so and also you can add another things and even it can turn blue Wow! so it's a resource that you have on the island <laughs> uh, do you know that no <laughs> so, oh, now you have it <laughs> so this one and where are the, these trees are all over around here Remember, I'm an archaeologist, but one of my of my uh, my bachelor degree was agroforestry. Right, so so I know forest. Yeah. <laughs> so this is also from here. This is the wood here, and this pebble is from the beach, and this is a piece of uh, of coral that I was from the sand. So and this is a, just a branch of a yellow prickle, that also you can use it for make a yellow dye. Oh, in fact, this arrow. Is dye with yellow prickle, wow. but it's a color kind of yellow, yeah. and it's, it stains the wood very nice. Oh, uh, this one is a it's a version of a Taino arrow, mm -hmm. but in in material in wood, mm -hmm. because the, the the original ones were made from a from a from a type of grass called wild cane. Uh, the original arrows were like uh, made from a from a grass that you can find it here also in St. Croix, but I didn't, I didn't uh, found it on time. Uh -huh. But from the stalk of the flower, you can make the arrow. Ah. 
It's a big, big stock. Looks like a sugar cane, but it's but it but it's not sweet. But in Cuba, they found in a in a lake, buried in the, in the mud, an adult. Forty-one inches. So, to pull this arrow, you have to imagine that the bow was big, <laughs> and in fact, it was big. Mm -hmm. So, so and also we have uh, they used bone. This is a bone tip, and the shaft is not from the warehouse, not uh, from the uh, from the. Uh, where, uh, where's stored when I, when I get the, the dowel? This is uh, Ginger Thomas. Yeah, like the bush with the uh, yeah the bush with the uh, yellow flowers that grows around. You're yeah, kidding. yeah, no, there you go. And this is a bone tip, and the bone tip, the bone is a material very very versatile because it's harder as wood, but it's <laughs> it's not heavy. And it can pierce through leather, <laughs> and most of, and, and there's a, most of the nasty wounds were made from bone bone, tip. bone tips. And the, what and kind the, of bone are you using? Uh, this is like a, I think it was uh, from a from a deer carcass that I found around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but this one, the uh, the bone tips are the ones also that were soaked in poison. Right. The machineel. The machineel, yeah. To hold the tip there, you have this glue, which is made of big wax, resin of the lignum vitae, and charcoal. Wow. And you can you can touch it. <laughs> it's like epoxy. Wow. And it's hard. <laughs> Doesn't go off. So. So what do you what if you were to say okay let's go hunting here what would you hunt with that iguanas iguanas yeah yeah I I I just deer go, also got that was uh, one of the goals but the thing is that I could uh, I could not uh, get the permit yeah I know legal um, and that's illegal and I, yeah. and, I, um, and also there are regulations about the ammunition that you need to to use to right. to hunt the deer because I believe to hunt the animal is a very special thing because you have to give him a just clean death. Right. You shoot, you strike the animal, mm -hmm. ploop, it's dead. Mm -hmm. I don't like uh, trophy hunting yeah. because it promotes uh, elitism, mm. and there is and it's something that it came with the with the with the notion of superiority. Yeah. So, I don't promote it, mm -hmm. and as a native descendant, I hunt since I was six with my father, mm -hmm. so I learned I hunt only to eat. Mm -hmm. If I don't eat it, I don't want to hunt it. 